In the following four videos, I am going to provide a brief summary of the contents of my four operative traditions essays. I've written several other books, uh, but in these videos, I'll specifically focus in this particular collection. Um, at first, uh, as an author of these uh, books, uh, I must introduce myself. My name is Miguel A. Fernandez, and my background and formation is in the field of industrial engineering, um, energy consultancy, logistics, uh, sustainability, and process modeling. All this might sound a bit um, sophisticated, uh, specialized, and not much connected to the field of uh, literature. Yet um, these volumes of operative traditions not only synthesize most of what I've learned uh, from such uh, multidisciplinary fields for about two decades, but also aim to provide such learning a cultural value. Um, now, what do I exactly mean by this, by cultural value? Well, mm, the fact that I have uh, resorted in this uh, collection to the works of many philosophers, uh, scientists and uh, artists was intended, just like in my other collections, uh, to uh, provide uh, the adequate language, uh, frameworks or concepts in order to de uh, define a set of phenomena and challenges that affect us all, here and now, uh, whether we know them or not. Challenges that are directly uh, related to the specifics of modern life. Um, whatever philosophies, cosmologies and ideas that were developed in the past assist me to understand and explain the present, the more I consider uh, more valid and substantial such works from a cultural viewpoint. Contrarily, all those works that impede me better relate to the specifics of our lives are those works which I have uh, not deemed necessary to incorporate in my own books. So um, I suppose it, it is a good idea to uh, initially explain the title of this collection, um, Operative Traditions. Mm, I think it is better to start with the second word, Traditions. Um, I guess we all have an intuitive idea of the meaning of uh, such word and in regard uh, to all the definitions I've read, I would say that the common denominator of most uh, definitions is that tradition implies, uh, one way or another, the transmission of a series of principles of life that have been legitimized by the past, uh, by our ancestors or by our cultural heritage. So in this sense, uh, the challenge to all tradition is a challenge imposed by the modification of human experience, um, by the adoption of uh, novel and unprecedented habits we have uh, on a daily basis. Um, for instance, what does the Catholic tradition affirm in regard to the use of television? As far as I know, uh, very little or simply nothing. And we can present countless cases of the conflict that exists between tradition and innovation. And um, in regard to this conflict, uh, many would be even inclined to consider that the traditions of the past are no longer applicable, no longer effective, when coping with uh, new challenges our modern life presents us with. Some might even believe that there is no conflict uh, at all and that we just ought to rely on the specific advantages our time provides us with, like those technical ones that provide us comfort or well-being. Considering that the entire past of the human condition no longer provides us any uh, reliable guidance. But here I have to ask, guidance uh, for what? Um, well, at this point is where I'll share with you what I consider as the pivotal aspect of tradition. Um, a tradition ought to provide meaning to our lives. It ought to contextualize our human experience so we can conceive and develop our entire life as a project, not as a plan and uh, not as a mere letting go. A tradition ought to provide uh, us guidance for facing with adequate principles the challenges and hardships of life, um, the moments of success, failure, pleasure and pain. 
the project must incorporate all the uh, all these life ingredients uh, so to speak but as you know any project has a beginning and an end at least uh, chronologically so which might be the end um, the goal of a human project guided by tradition um, let's try to put it uh, allegorically let's say you want to climb a mountain okay so your project is to get to the top uh, like the woman who is in the cover art of this volume well she's already at the top lucky her now if you want to climb a mountain is, is it a good idea to follow a plan or in other words should you strictly uh, rely on a confirmed and fixed itinerary or route to get to the top if the territory hasn't changed much uh, why not but if uh, let's say a dam has been recently constructed right on one of the mountains uh, flanks then very likely you are forced to improvise and to find out an uh, alternative route um, let's say that even the mountain's peak is constantly covered uh, by fog how can you fulfill your project with all these contingent uh, circumstances um, one option is to abort the project but let's say you don't want to abort it how do you orientate yourself so you reach to the top of the mountain and finally contemplate how all your actions and experiences during such project uh, not only uh, converged in one single point but were all even directly connected to the conditions granted by nature by everything that surrounds you this um, allegory can allow us to understand quite briefly the key issue that occurs uh, with tradition uh, today and I would even, even dare to say that with tradition in all times all traditions affirm implicitly that such higher point that such uh, higher meaning that such um, higher goal does actually exist in life but that the mapping out of such route by most traditions is today interrupted by novel circumstances and uh, even um, how could I say a uh, kind of foggy intellectual atmosphere especially in mainstream media that persuades us to believe that the existence of any meaning of life is just an illusion and that it is much uh, smarter to just rely on the power of means instead of the power of meanings so how can this uh, predicament be solved here is where precisely the term operative comes in okay let's say our climber is trained in um, rather old alpinist techniques that have become uh, ineffective when challenging novel circumstances of the mountain in this case uh, he or she shall be unable to um, ground uh, their experience and as you can easily uh, imagine losing ground is a very dangerous risk when climbing so the best we can do for our climber is to uh, provide a discipline where grounding experience is the first main purpose to ground experience is to let our senses capture the characteristics of the elements that we interact with if we provide this uh, discipline to our climber then the climber shall progressively uh, gain an authentic knowledge of the mountain where the perceptive faculties uh, become awakened enlightened so that along a sort of um, trial and error process the climber eventually defines a new route just like all pioneers a route that gets to the top finally discovering that in effect all former experiences made sense and became perfectly integrated so this little metaphor mm, serves to show how the route to tradition the route to a life full of meaning is of an operative type now maybe we've heard the term operative many times uh, for instance when an engineer films that a device or machine is uh, operative which in many cases uh, is synonym of uh, functional however when I refer to the term operative in all these volumes I always refer to opus operis 
Um, both Latin terms express a creative activity that aspires towards meaning. In medieval times, um, and especially during the Gothic flourishing period, the development of opus was entitled to the operative Freemasons, who essentially conceive work as the construction of meaning. These master architects deeply understand that we can't separate the way we work, the materials provided by nature, from who we are, and that the only way to progress our knowledge is by first capturing the language of nature, and secondly by affirming it, by producing it. Even the great modern Spanish architect, Antonio Raudí, was rather influenced by this cooperative idea, affirmed uh, that, and he affirmed that um, the, the only book worth reading is our nature. So, um, the framework uh, I'm pointing out uh, here might seem radical or rather incomprehensive, but the reason for this is that the operative Freemasons uh, extinguished around the 16th, uh, 17th century and left no more footprints in history and uh, much less in history books. As um, former cultural representatives and master architects, this cultural elite became substituted by the speculative masonry in 1717 in London. This was uh, actually a, a crucial tipping point in the history of the West. Um, in essence, because at that time Western culture was uh, very influenced by modern science, rationalism, and the pursuit of knowledge restricted to books. Um, we can't deny the influence of Gutenberg's invention of print during the 15th century in this crucial modification. Um, so since around the 18th century, we can say that uh, progressively the language of nature became superseded by a set of worldviews that in essence assume that nature can exclusively be understood through experimentation, measurement, control, and that such understanding can only be acknowledged in the form of laws that are dogmatically considered that don't vary in time. Um, at that time, to even pose the possibility that nature had a language of her own, a language that transcends human rationalization, um, an idea that Goethe or William Blake uh, defended, was conceived as totally heretic by the cultural establishment of such a period. Um, curiously enough, it was during such a period that some um, thinkers began to radically ponder the idea that the West was experiencing decadence, a decline. Now this might seem quite shocking or paradoxical, considering all the dynamic developments at an economic or demographic uh, level taking place during such a period, and all the economic opportunities offered to populations affected by industrialization. I think uh, that uh, German philosopher Friedrich um, Nietzsche, uh, German philosopher Oswald Spang Spengler, and Spanish philosopher José de Gasset were those who pioneered uh, this perception of cultural decline. And as I point out in this uh, volume, if these thinkers are referring to any type of decline, they are ultimately affirming that such decline is expressed in the unquestioned cultural assumption that life has no uh, meaning and that all that counts are the means. Um, in a nutshell, these men were pointing out that the appropriation of means was substituting meanings. So in this volume one, um, I described the decline of the West, uh, especially by pointing out the crucial uh, significance of the law of entropy stated by Rudolf Clausius in 1850. Um, this law of entropy acts at all levels, and to explain it as simply as possible, it states that nothing lasts forever. Um, I guess some of you might have deeply intuited this. Um, well. Um, as a consequence of this uh, critical law, all former traditions, religions and values, even political values, became powerless in practice to master and unveil 
the meaning of uh, progressively greater complex processes taking place in industry and uh, technoscience, not only dissolving the jurisdiction of national boundaries, but even dissolving uh, practically all former morals and ethics, and allowing individuals to gain a new sense of freedom. But as I also point out in such section, such new um, sense of freedom can only be conceived as very um, relative. Um, why? Okay, if we go back to our climber uh, metaphor, in the case the mountain has been invaded by noble infrastructures, such as roads, electric grids, or cableways, the ascension to the mountain is practically the same for all tourists. And this is so because the, the tourists make use of exactly the same means of transport. Their meanings are practically the same. Um, what do I mean by this? That it is no longer about ascending by oneself the mountain. It is no longer about encountering a meaning in life, an absolute freedom, but about experiencing the thrill of individual power that is provided by noble technical means. So the decline of the West can be expressed as the individual feeling of liberation from all former traditional or even religious worldviews, a liberation from all those compasses that implicitly provided guidance for developing a project of life full of absolute meaning. I mean, why learn any hard discipline of alpinism if you have available a powerful cableway that can take you to the top of the mountain without any effort? Why even bother to even discover the mountain by yourself if you have GPS? Um, and yet, during this period in the West, especially at the beginning of the uh, 1900s, a time where novel infrastructures and technologies began to powerfully overlay the former autochthonous landscape uh, of nature. There was a um, German author and Pour le Marie, a uh, war meritorious, uh, war prized uh, uh, warrior spirit, and uh, Junger, who envisioned a human type capable of relating to such means, yet with a purely operative spirit. This is, as intending to relate to all technical means um, uh, of power, um, exclusively for pursuing meaning, for pursuing absolute freedom. Junger referred to this type as the worker, but um, due to the purely uh, operative spirit of the figure uh, that he envisioned, I have uh, preferred to refer to such figure in all volumes of operative traditions as the operator. Um, however, as I point out in this volume one, the progressive eruption of cybernetic architectures since the 1920s, uh, for instance, server systems and uh, computers, gave less and less chance to fulfill Junger's ideal, mainly because these architectures oblige you to um, operate power based on an exact mathematical language, um, surrendering to such architectures language that impedes you gain access to what Junger referred to as the realm of the elementary. This is access to that realm where the deathly law of entropy dissolves all boundaries, um, all conceptual uh, identifications, and even your self-same uh, sense of uh, individuality. This uh, realization encouraged Junger to be like uh, Aldous Huxley, one of the first pioneers in the inner potentials of psychedelic experience in the 1950s, especially in the case of the LSD experience provided by, to him by his friend Albert Hoffman, the actual discoverer of such substance. But during those um, years, there were still another pathways available in order to pursue uh, absolute freedom and meaning in life. And this connects um, to the arc, bow and uh, arrow sustained by the woman that uh, appears in the cover art. Um, around the beginning of the last century, there was a German uh, 
philosopher Eugen Hergel, who rather discontent with the speculative and idealist philosophy that impregnated to a large extent the academic domain that he was involved in as a teacher, um, traveled to Japan and had the chance of practicing a very specific discipline, Kyudo, tra which is traditional Japanese archery. Um, a Zen discipline that is purely operative in nature and which provides a framework that allows discovering meaning, a meaning that connects the external and internal world of the student. Hirigal's account is quite um, extraordinary, uh, I believe, and the question that arises after reading his experience is the following. Is there uh, any way we can actually transport the operative principles of such Zen discipline to activities such as business, engineering, architecture, physical activity, art uh, or science? I've always known that such bridge between the operative disciplines of the, of the West and the East is possible to build, but I lacked the adequate philosophical framework to express such bridge. Um, until I discovered around 2014 the so-called theory and phenomenology of the absolute individual, developed by Italian philosopher Julius Evola in the 1920s, 1930s framework that is also linked to his notion of magical idealism. Um, the major contribution of Evola's philosophy is to provide a set of categories of experience instead of a set of categories of thought. Also, Evola defines an I that is neither the self of modern psychology nor the ego. Um, the nature of this uh, I is purely operative. Or in other words, it expresses a very uh, specific relation to the means of power we have at reach. Call it style, if you wish. And this I transcends the self-same individual boundaries to the point that uh, one no longer knows if one plays with the objects or the objects play with oneself. So this dissolution of boundaries also dissolves uh, dualism. This is the separation that was defined mostly in Judeo-Christianity between creator and creation. So, in this volume one, I make use of Eugen Hrigel's uh, experience in the Zen art of archery as a particular case, um, or better said, as a uh, practical case of the philosophy of categories of experience outlined by Julius Evola. This didactic exposition has also obliged me to address here as briefly as possible the issue of technique. Now, technique is a concept that is much wider than technology and refers to the invisible yet powerful uh, connections we have defined with our means at reach. But why invisible? Because we can only discern our technique when we develop motion in a situation where we also succeed in connecting to the elementary, to all those risky or stressful uh, contexts where all conceptual frameworks are dissolved and where our individuality no longer exists. Technique is affirmed in the mode of gestures that are not controllable by our conscious mind. And it took several years for Eugen Herigel to unravel this extraordinary phenomenon of the senses. Eventually, the operative practice uh, leads to the practical discovery of qi. This is that Eastern term that refers to a mode of intelligent and creative energy that allows life to constantly have a meaning in the present moment. Um, qi acts as a sort of a countercurrent to the law of entropy and can produce miraculous uh, uh, and extraordinary gestures in the artists that succeed in defying the power of all physical laws. Um, I refer to these phenomena as flash phenomena. And in the case of Herigl's experience, the master Awakenzo referred to such transcendent power as it. Um, these phenomena are characterized above all by an intense concentration of power and speed that transcends conscious control. 
It is like phenomenon that happened in the blink of an eye. Um, it must be noted that the purpose of the discipline is not to develop uh, such extraordinary power, but that such power uh, um, are rather signs or pointers that indicate that a deep connection with the Earth's language has been effectively um, activated. Um, anyone can eventually experience uh, this T force in the most varied ways. Um, for instance, years ago, uh, a friend succeeded in recording me uh, exposing this type of power, even when I was suffering from a severe broken cough in my leg. This um, is the flash. Here crucial. you can see uh, the clip, and even after it, um, um, after its recording, I watched it. Uh, once and again, uh, mostly trying to recall the type of inner feelings and contextualization. Um, I have to say that I only had the courage to perform two of these moves in my entire life, mostly due to the uh, extreme risk involved for the entire body, especially when concentration or focus are not perfectly aligned. Essentially, the feeling is that of trying to surf a huge wave. Uh, which can either lift you or kill you. So we are talking about the awakening of a very powerful energy here, a very intelligent and uh, capricious form of energy that deserves utmost re respect. And it is precisely in the conclusion of this volume where I essentially aim to explain that the discovery of this connection to the vital force of the Earth it's not even a conclusion, but rather a point of departure. A point of departure towards a journey that takes place in um, a high mountain, so to speak, in a domain of freedom that is far away from the conflicts or unbalances that often characterize human societies. It is like the flight of an eagle around the high and solitary peaks. It is the living in this world, but not uh, being of this world. It is a mode of life that has always been considered to be as living in the world of tradition.